Amen. 1 Samuel 17, verse 34. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Man, there's a lot of smiting and slaying going on. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. You think he wants us to know that? I mean, he's repeated it in about every way he can, right? Well, you got to understand, he's trying to convince Saul here. Let me say that again. He's trying to convince Saul here that little David can take on great big Goliath. So that's why he consistently keeps saying and talking about his education in the sheep field. Okay? Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hands of the Philistines. I want to talk to you um, for just a little while from the thought, preparing the way of victory. God began to reveal some stuff to me, began to show me, and he said, son, listen, you always look at any kind of aggression or any kind of a situation that comes against you always is a negative thing, but what you need that you have to work out, but what I'm trying to tell you is sometimes going back to the sheep field is not a demotion at all. Maybe I'm just tired of you playing the harp and I want to make you a giant slayer. Are you listening? <laughs> you get, hey, yay, that's a nice little golf clap there. Maybe I'll get louder and you'll get louder. We'll find out. That's good preaching whether you like it or not. Amen? And God began to just show me some stuff, and he said, Son, listen, what, what do you think? Where do you think David learned to fight things? He learned to fight his battles, not on the battlefield with Goliath. He learned it in the sheep field. And now he's standing here trying to tell Saul, Listen, you, all the armies are huddled over here behind a rock, and you're afraid of this guy. I'm telling you, I know what God will do through me. Now watch. I, I, I want to make this as clear as I can. Because of um, opportunities in the next, I don't know, couple of months, whatever, few months that I think that we have, we are, uh, that God is moving in this house and has asked us to do certain things, there is a reality that we have to, um, oh, Lord, what's the words I'm trying to find? We have to sometimes step out in faith when faith is all you have. See, God will ask you sometimes to start on a vision without the provision. Let me say it again. There are times God will ask you to step out in faith when faith is the only commodity you have. Amen? God has really been stirring in me, and every time I, and I don't know how else to explain it, but every time I, my faith starts getting built up to the place where, like, I'm going to charge hell with a water pistol, the enemy will show up and say something else. Anybody been there? Amen? Now watch. So I believe that sometimes God is requiring us, okay, to move forward even when we don't see anything. Let me put it like this. There's not a military strategist in the entire world that would that would think that the Red Sea experience was going to turn out well militarily. What are you talking about? Well, think about it. Take two million of your soldiers and walk them right up to the edge with the enemy behind you. How do you think that's going to work out? Amen? Yet God said, I want you to just go in faith like I told you. Amen. It doesn't matter that Pharaoh's breathing down your neck. It doesn't make any difference that things don't always look exactly like you want them to look. It doesn't even matter whether or not you think you got everything you need. All I need you to do is trust me. Amen. Now watch. Just hang on. We'll get there. I promise. Yep. We can go right there. For years, I studied David, his sling, 
and his stones. Because there were a few things that didn't make a lot of sense to me. The, the biggest thing in that whole episode, and I, I didn't read it to you because it, it all fits into this narrative, but if you read your Bible, it says really plainly that David went to the brook and chose five smooth stones. Yet the Bible records that David just threw one. Now, who got that wrong? Because I'm thinking when I'm reading, listen, I don't know how your mind works, but I'm thinking when I'm reading this story, I'm thinking, well, um, but wait, wouldn't it have been much more faith-tastic if he'd have just got one stone and somebody said, you only got one, and he said, I ain't going to need but one. Because that's the way the American Hollywood would have produced it. Amen? I got one, I ain't going to need, but I'm just, I'm just taking one. But that's not what it says. Now, I did a study looking at those stones, and some, somewhere in the, in, in the process of that, my mind began to wonder, and I began to think about the provision of God and how God works. Now, I've shared this part with you before, but I began to think about how God literally, some point, listen, I don't know how old the earth is. Are you listening? Some people, people creationists, that that uh, that our traditional says it's only six thousand whatever seven seven thousand years old. Others that believe in what's called the gap theory or believe that Genesis one one and Genesis one two are divided in time. Those believe that it could be billions of years old. I you know I don't know how you fit all the dinosaurs and the different stuff in there if it's if there wasn't a pre edemic world. You say well the Bible talks about the Leviathan yeah but they missed a whole bunch of stuff like the raptor and the T Rex and all those guys. You with me? So I'm guessing that instead of being arrogant, I'm going to guess that God's been creating for infinity. Amen? And that although humans think we're the best, we're the only thing going, that God has been creating for probably eternity. Are you listening? One thing I know, there's no other mankind made in the likeness and image of God. That's true. And there's no other fallen race that needed a Savior because the Bible says Jesus died once. Amen? Once and for all. So this is a unique situation. We are on a unique planet. We are dealing with a unique dispensation, so to speak, because God made us in his likeness, in his image. However, this earth is most likely millions or maybe billions of years old. I don't know for sure, and if that offends your sensibility, God bless you. If you got your theory, that's just fine. But what I want to talk to you about is whether it's a few thousand years old or a few billion years old, think about what it took to have just five, listen, David Strong strolling, he's fixing to go fight Goliath, and he's strolling by the brook, leans over, and starts looking for five smooth stones, not the jagged ones, not the square ones, but the just right round ones that'll fly straight in his sling so that it will hit where it's supposed to hit. Have you any idea how long it took God to roll those rocks down the river until they got just the right size and become just smooth enough so that they flew in David's sling? Listen, God was preparing that weapon long before David was even thought of in the mind of his mama and daddy. Why? Because God is perfect in his provision. And every time he asks you to do something, he will make a way for it to happen. So now he's made five smooth stones and David finds them just at the right time. But he only needs one. And that used to bug me. I'm like, God, why? What's he going to do with them other four? Listen, do you think about your Bible or do you just kind of read it when you fall asleep? I mean, it's afraid. Listen, I get it because it, uh, reading makes me sleepy too. Usually the Bible doesn't, but reading makes me sleepy. I don't know how many Christians I've heard. Well, if I want to go to sleep, all I got to do is get out of my Bible. But don't tell everybody that. Yeah. And the re- but the reality is, is that when I read stuff like that, I I just, you know, the old say, remember inquiring minds want to know? I want to know. I mean, I know God doesn't do anything on accident. He doesn't put, it's not filler. 
Like, well, we need to tell this story, so we're just going to have him get five rocks. He's got a reason for it. And listen, now, I can't prove this biblically, but as I was studying, I began to look back at the different things that God would prophesy over the armies of Israel, and he'd talk about people come, enemies coming from the north, and he defeated them. Enemies coming from the west, and he'd defeat those armies. Enemies coming from the north, south, east, and west, and God would defeat all those armies. And somehow, somewhere, I got it in my mind that David reached over and picked up five smooth stones because he was going to need one that day, and there was one one for every other direction. Just bring them on. <laughs> North, south, east, and west. It doesn't matter where you bring your giant from. I am walking with God, and if God be for me, who can be against me? It doesn't make any difference where you come from and where you, how much the enemy comes against me. God is with me, and because he's with us, church, we win. Now, you can have another theory, but I like mine. It preaches well. Amen? Now watch, the, the human, how do I say this? The human um, condition is to always take adversity as a negative thing. Amen? Now listen, I, I told you years ago, and I, Carl at least, at least listened. He's been, he's been listening to the guy ever since. But Ron Carpenter wrote a book called The Necessity of, the enemy, of an Enemy, and I, I read it. It's now been, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, maybe longer. And I suggested it to you because I believe it's one of the best books I've ever seen written on the reality is without an enemy, you never have victory. Amen? If there are no challenges, you learn nothing. So the question doesn't become whether or not, because there, see, um, there is this deal that's happened in charismatic circles over the last 30 years that somehow you can confess enough and pray enough and fast enough that you'll have no trouble. Let me just tell you straight up, that ain't in your Bible. That is straight up a lie. And the people who are pretending it's like that are lying to you. Amen? Because your Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. It's going to happen. You're going to deal with adversity. Every single patriarch in your Bible dealt with great adversity. The point wasn't whether or not God was with them so he kept them from charging. The point was when they charge, is God with you now? Amen? And that is the, is, is the way that God teaches us or raises us up in faith. So now your test, your testing becomes your character. Stay with me. See, I, um, there's something that, that, that when I started pastoring, this is the first time I ever pastored. I've been in ministry a long time. I was youth pastor, but the first time I was senior pastor is this little experiment. We're now 18 years in. Amen. And I have been wonderfully blessed by the whole experience, okay? Not wonderfully blessed by all the people that were in that experience. But, see, I learned something. You, there's always going to be Judases around. It doesn't matter where you work, amen? Where you worship, going to town, at Walmart, wherever you go, there's always going to be Judases around. There are always going to be people in your life who think they have the authority to decide what happens in your ministry. You say, well, I don't have a ministry. Yeah, you do. If you're, if you're blood-bought, you do. Amen? We'll just call it life for you. If you're not taking the microphone like I am, I'll just call it life. There's always Judases around who, act, who are under the assumption that they have the authority to tell you what to do. Amen? You can't let, listen, I, I, how do I say this? The reason that God so often asks you to step out on faith to do something when you don't have the provision and you don't have the people and you don't have whatever it is. Listen, God, I think God's tired of people telling him what they don't have. I ain't got enough money. I'm too young. I'm too old. Whatever it is, quit telling God what you don't have and share with him what you do have, which is I believe my God is bigger than any of my circumstances. He's bigger than any disease. He's bigger than any challenge. He's bigger than anything that I've ever gone through or that I will ever go through. So since he's bigger, I'm going to trust him. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to believe him. Amen? See, there's, there's, there's a reality about, how do I say this? When, when, when COVID happened and, and all, you know, it's just like, oh, and I hate to be offensive, but this is the reality. What it did was expose a lot of people who just um, weren't really that serious about God. It gave people an out. Amen? It did. Oh, I can't go. No, I can't go because it's dangerous now. It gave people out, and so many people have still retained that habit. Amen? And during that process, I mean, like, God, it's like we worked and worked and worked and get to this point, and now the devil gets this COVID thing, and now we're fighting. And I, and I understand I talk about it a lot, but I'm talking about it because it's this line of demarcation in the history of the church. And if the Lord should tarry, you will look back and see what damage was done. Amen? When you cho- closed that many houses, I heard one preacher say, well, if they're closed and didn't open, they should have been closed. First of all, who made you God? That is ridiculous. That is, in my opinion, that's the height of arrogance. And you are as guilty of cursing as anybody. Let me just throw this out there. Cursing ain't the same thing as cussing. The Bible don't want you cursing anybody. Are you listening? It means don't talk about your neighbors. Hey, listen, I know of which I'm talking. I've got some bad ones. Amen. I got some really good ones, and I got a few. Oh, Lord Jesus. I wish somebody would just go witness to them, let them say, Lord, come in my heart, and just knock them in the head and get them out of here before they had a chance to change. <laughs> Cursing is when you spending your time flapping your jaws about so-and-so. Well, they ought to do this and they ought to do that and she ought to do this and she ought to do that. That's cursing. Are you with me? That's what the Bible is against. Amen? That's what the Bible says do not do. Amen? And I have said it a thousand times, and I'm going to say it one more time this morning, the same hell that waits for all those sins that you talk about so bad that other people have is waiting for you. If it isn't edification, just skip it. Amen? It ain't like you got, well, maybe there's a handful. It seems like they got all day long spent on Facebook to talk about everybody. But if you think about how precious life is and how short years go, maybe you should do something productive. You're not the policeman for the kingdom of God. Or do you think you are? God's got his own police. They're called the Holy Ghost. He'll take care of it. Amen? Now watch. I'm, I'm getting close. Listen, I'm not going to be super long-winded, but I'm, I can give you all this stuff. I want you to think about something for just a minute. Now I'll, I'll try to. I'm doing pretty good. It's not a, for me. That's just rude. Now you're just rude. <laughs> God, most of the time, will ask you to do something that's beyond you. And I've heard preachers say this for years, and it's true. If you could do what God asked you to do, then it wouldn't be God, it'd be you. So most of the time when God challenges us, puts us in the desert, has us fighting something, he does it so that he can not only get our faith to a certain point, but so that he can get the credit and the glory for it once he finishes it. Okay, because everybody knows if you could do it, you would. Amen? Let's, put, let's, 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 let's say it like this. You remember the whole Sarah and Abraham? I'm sitting there looking this morning at all the rockets and all the stuff that come, come, you know, come over Israel last night, some 200 plus. Yeah. 
200 plus. And I'm, 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 I'm thinking about a world of anti-Semitism who thinks that's okay. Now, listen, thank God, at least for now, our government is standing with Israel. I hate that word because you don't really get to say we're for Israel, but then tongue lash them behind their back. But that's what's happened. The most inconsistent, of course, then if you couldn't remember where your toothbrush was, that's probably the kind of foreign policy you'd have. Yeah, glory. Amen. Kind of all over the map. I'm just saying. Well, you know, I had to get it in there. We, we, so they're like, yeah, we're with them, but if they do this, we're going to, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? They go into Rafa. We're going to, what are you going to do, Miss Vice President? What are you going to do? Tackle? You ain't going to do nothing. No matter what you do, God is with Israel. You make no difference. The only reason we want to make sure the United States supports Israel is not so Israel doesn't get in trouble, it's so we don't get in trouble. Amen? I'm all for them because God told me to be for them. Amen? But if you, listen, if the entire United States decided tomorrow not to do a single thing, not to give them weapons or whatever, if God had to put rocks and sticks in their hands, I promise you they'd defeat every nation that came against them. Why? Because God said so. So, I'm listening, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about, you know who's made these decisions, it's the mullahs in Iran. Now, listen, it's been said for quite some time now, for probably 15 years, maybe a little longer, that the Iranian people are actually sick and tired of the mullahs. They're, they're, they don't, they're constantly, listen, they take all their money they, and, and use it to build rockets to try to kill a nation they're never going to defeat. Amen? And, and the wise ones have figured this out. After about 40 years of lobbing rockets, all you've done is just kick the beehive. Amen? And a lot of the Iranian people are tired of it. However, I'm thinking about this, and I begin to think about the media who lies about Israel and the people who are attacking Israel. And I began to really look at it, and I, was, and I, was, I did a little research on this last night, and I began to realize, listen, I've told you this before. The, the, the Arab nations or the Muslim faith comes from Ishmael, okay? Ishmael. Now, God said, when Abraham sent Ishmael away, God said, because he's your son, I'm going to bless him. Do you read your Bible? So whether you like it or not, they're blessed. Them dudes walking around in, in, in skirts and that towel around their head, most of those guys got a lot of money. Amen? Some of the wealthiest nations on the planet Little bitty tiny things about the size of our states, just filthy rich with oil money. Why? Because God keeps his promises. No matter how bad you mess it up, God keeps his promises. However, so think about that for a minute. However, ever, the Jewish people are even more blessed. Why? Because Isaac was the promised child. So how did we get here? Because the reality is, and I was kind of ran this down, and I believe that secular society is uh, the spirit of Esau. Okay, I was talking with someone last week, and they were talking about um, Jacob and Esau and coming out of the womb or whatever. And if you if you if you look at that, I don't have time to preach that. It's not it, but maybe I will at some point. But I believe uh, the media, the liberal liberal secular society that we see in this country and across the world, I believe they are descendants, or they are descendants of the spirit of Esau. The Muslim, the Arab nations that are that rise up against Israel, that all came from descendants of Ishmael. Okay. And then you have the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, and us who have been grafted into that vine, according to Jesus Christ, when he came, was crucified for us. So we were grafted into that family. You have, and we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Not just Abraham, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Are you with me? Pure bloodline. Now, why... Are we thousands of years later watching rockets lobbed over Israel after all this time? 
One reason, because Sarah and Abraham didn't think God could bring forth the promise he said he would. Sarah decided at some point that God needed a little help. Am I telling you the truth? Is that what your Bible says? Yes? So he just, she decided God needed some help. In other words, yeah, God made this great promise, and that's great and everything, Abraham, but you're old and I'm old. We're all old. Let's get Hagar. She's not old. And at some point, I would have went back to her and said, but you said I was. Okay. (laughs) Think for just a minute what the world would be like had Sarah just said, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm going to have a baby if I'm 150. No rockets last night. Nothing. No fighting over the Middle East and Jerusalem, all these all these millennium. If Sarah and Abraham would just have believed God for the impossible. Amen. You see, you have to understand when you try to help God out, what it usually ends up happening is generations of trouble. Say that again. When you try to help God out, what usually ends up happening is generations of trouble. Not just trouble in your lifetime, but trouble in the lifetimes of those you love for generations ahead. If they would have just said, I know this is impossible, but I serve a God of the impossible. Amen? You see, it really was a test. It was a trying. I'm closing. I promise. Just like I was closing a while ago. I'm getting there. It was a test to see if Abraham, listen, what's so interesting to me is the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So at some point, Abraham was a believer. But at this juncture in his life, this test proved to be more than he could handle. How you doing? You got a promise coming. How you doing? Is the test more than you can handle? Are you about ready to take things into your own hands? Let me challenge you. Let me warn you, don't do that. Let God be God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 